So the University of Calgary, located in the heart of Southern Alberta, both acknowledges and pays tribute to the traditional territories of the peoples of Treaty 7, which include the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Siksika, Pekani, Kanai First Nations, the Sutina First Nation, the Stony Nakoda, including Chinakee, Bears Paw, and Good Stony First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. The University of Calgary is situated in the land northwest of where the Bow River meets the Elbow, a site traditionally known as Mokinsis to the Blackfoot, uh, Wichispa to the Stony Nakoda, and Kutsitsis to the Sutina. On this land and in this place, we strive to learn together, walk together, and grow together in a good way. So um, welcome, everyone, to uh, tonight's lecture. And I hope people had time to um, take a look at the exhibit. I'd like to start by sending out a special thank you to our sponsors for this event. So I won't make the people from Dialogue stand. Um, I mean, you can if you want. but. I'd like to thank Dialogue for their support of this and a lot of other uh, things that we do at the school. And I think, you know, we appreciate the continued engagement of uh, them with, with all of us and all the uh, various programs that we have going on. Um, I'm going to start uh, this with a two minute video. And I'm going to hope not to screw this up, but I need to transfer it to the screen through. On behalf of the Fondation Le Corbusier, I would like to thank all of those who made this exhibition possible, with very special thanks to René Tan. The exhibited models of Le Corbusier are the product of his interns who started at his agency by studying and building a scaled model of a Le Corbusier project. René takes also his collaborators to France to discover and experience the architecture of Le Corbusier. This opportunity is a perfect way to understand Le Corbusier's spirit, who never studied architecture in school, but spent many years of his youth visiting architectural designs all around the world, learning from them and from different experiences to develop his own unique and unconventional style. This exhibition is linked to the core mission of the foundation Le Corbusier established when he was still alive, to contribute to the knowledge, understanding and influence of his ideas and work. We are grateful to all of you to contribute to our mission and more important, the challenge we are facing today, the relevance of Le Corbusier to the younger generations. With the end of architectural modernism, Le Corbusier has lost part of its aura as an unrivaled master constantly present to the mind of young architects. It is now part of history. Speaking of the present, this is for us an essential question. How to ensure that Le Corbusier is relevant to future generations? Three possible answers. First, the legacy of modernism is everywhere. The key to the future is to understand it better, especially since we will have to renovate more and more rather than demolishing and building something entirely new. Second, the aesthetic's quality and the emotion. There is something in architecture that transcends through time. This is evident in the case of Le Corbusier, but of course not only. Third, how does architecture cope with a given context? Architecture is a, is a lesson in the relevance of design for society and culture. The issues of housing for modern man and housing for the greatest number is a major challenge facing our societies today and modern architecture in particular. It was also the major challenge for Le Corbusier. I hope that while our world is currently living with the fear of the other, 
the architecture of Le Corbusier rooted in the dialogue between generations, countries and culture will continue to inspire us. This is, I hope, the experience we are all sharing today and I thank you to make it possible. So I'm going to, first I'll introduce you, Renee, and then uh, uh, we'll, we'll go from there. So um, I'd like you to join me in welcoming uh, Renee Tan and Ian Soon to SAPL. Um, they're uh, co-responsible for uh, the work that's out in the, in the gallery here, and I think Renee is going to explain that a bit more here in a minute, and Ian as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's, it's an interesting story that I'll let him maybe tell, but for this project to come uh, to us all the way from uh, Singapore. Uh, so, Renee is uh, uh, the principal at RT plus Q Architects in Singapore. And Renee, I'm gonna toss it over to you uh, so that you can you can start. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jason. I'm just thrilled to see this whole thing arrive in uh, Canada and in uh, Calgary. I was actually there last week, hoping to give this uh, talk live, but alas, the models uh, were late. But um, all the same, just very happy to see uh, uh, Le, Le Corbusier in a new uh, continent. Well, I think uh, speaking of continents, you probably would know that the models have journeyed from Singapore for the last year and a half. And it was in uh, Europe for a while, and then now in Calgary. <coughs> I'm particularly thrilled about Calgary because I think it's a city that has done a lot for itself, including uh, hosting the Olympics. Now, what is interesting here too, I wanted to tell everyone is that uh, Ian has a, a tracker for the models and we could actually tell that the models left Europe via Valencia and made it to uh, Canada uh, at Halifax before uh, moving along again. Now, uh, this was actually an idea that was born out of COVID because uh, for about two years, there was no travel. So it was uh, an idea of bringing uh, Le Corbusier to people uh, right at the doorstep. I'm just going to spend about 15 minutes uh, telling uh, you all about the background of uh, this collection before Miguel uh, takes over with his uh, keynote lecture. So just some background information and questions that people normally ask. And uh, the first thing I think that we should know is that we are very grateful that uh, the Foundation Le Corbusier in Paris actually uh, supports this. And it was very nice to uh, listen to Bridget again uh, earlier. I've always talked about this being a natural, natural conclusion and tangible manifestations of my, uh, my time in uh, school, just like, uh, just like most of you today. When I was Prince at Princeton, I guess we talked about this a little bit more only because in 1946, uh, both Einstein and uh, Corbusier were there. So until uh, recently, I was there in the late 80s and uh, we were rather aware of uh, what's happening. Now, I think uh, the true heroes of uh, this exhibition is uh, indeed these uh, interns who has been uh, doing this as a tradition. It's just a uh, a, a one-week exercise in our office where every intern comes in and builds a model. And uh, why do we do that? Probably because uh, we were never ready for uh, these interns and we thought that they should spend the first week looking at uh, a work of a great master rather than even doing a second-rate work for uh, RT and Q. It had very humble beginnings. We started off uh, right here in this shop house for the last 20 years, right in the attic. And uh, it was uh, an idea that, if you will, went rather viral. And of course, lately we have been doing the models, uh, 3D printing them rather than just cardboard. On why Le Corbusier, for a few reasons, uh, I think the most uh, the short answer is because it's just there. But uh, on a more serious note, I think uh, more than any architect, uh, he's uh, prolific and he personifies our diversity and progress 
building virtually in all continents. And uh, we started uh, with Le Corbusier, uh, especially the purest projects of the 1920s, because it was just the easiest things to build in view of its uh, clean, simple, and rectilinear shapes. And of course, uh, the influence of uh, Corbusier's uh, pervasive, he has been uh, interpreted everywhere, including uh, the two slides on the left in Malaysia. And mind you, the slide on the bottom right is uh, actually in India and not quite the Massey block that we have known so dearly. And of course, practicing and living uh, architecture in Singapore for the last years, uh, the legacy of modernity is all around it, especially here where a lot of the population live in uh, public housing. I thought too that uh, these days it's worth taking another look at Corbusier because of the environmental issue. And uh, wherever Cobb built, uh, whichever continent, I think he was sensitive to the climactic situ situations. And uh, I like to think of him as in fact an early advocate of uh, sustainability and architecture before the mechanized world actually came along. Now uh, on grants, when I was teaching at Syracuse one afternoon, the dean came into my office and asked me, hey, Renee, what are you doing this summer? I said, no, no real plans. He said, what if we gave you a little modest grant and please go to Europe and see all the Le Corbusier you can, as well as Palladio. Uh, if not, don't come back. I was a young professor at that point. Subsequent to that, of course, I had the best travel companions uh, uh, in my wife, Weiwei. Uh, who's probably seen more Cobb than the average architect. And then Lara, when our daughter came along, it was actually very nice traveling with her because being a kid, she would usually outrun me and tell me, hey, look, look at this, how cool is this? And it taught me to look at architecture, not from an adult architect's point of view, but through the eyes of a child. And this became, well, I think it's a personal odyssey, although uh, Lara thinks it's a passion and my wife certainly thinks of it as a, an obsession. I have uh, through the years actually seen uh, about, uh, well, put it this way, I've not seen eight of the 66 buildings that are left uh, standing in the world. And I've always been challenging colleagues like uh, Ian to uh, go to Baghdad and even to Carthage uh, to seek out the ones that we have not yet seen. We are RT and Q architects. Uh, I'm uh, uh, RT and uh, I've got a uh, partner, uh, Mr. Quack. And uh, we are a normal practicing office. We do all sorts of things, architecture for everyone, for animals, even for the dead. And we, 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 we are just happy to see how we can contribute. And after 20 years, you'll see we are beginning to put together a book of our works that's due out in a few uh, months. As an office, we try to travel. We are a smallish uh, office. And uh, I've always believed that uh, the worst place really to learn about architecture is the office itself. So every year we try to do a trip. We teach as well as adjuncts at the local universities. Uh, last year on a recent trip, we did a... Uh, the Corbusier and Paris trip. We took the students to Paris and to France. And then the idea would be for them to, to exercise and apply whatever they have learned to a subsequent project. And in this case, the final uh, uh, project was to redo the roof of the Notre Dame in Paris. At this point, I'm just uh, going to get Ian to uh, take over and say a few words uh, before I come back to close it off with the last few slides. Ian, can you take over? Hi, right, thanks, Renee. So, hi, everyone. I'm Ian from Singapore, and I work with Renee in his office. So, I work very closely with the interns to bring about this project. And uh, I would like to tell you a few like short stories and anecdotes. So, um, every time a new intern comes, all of us in the office would have uh, some sort of confusion. So, we would debate on what, what kind of project should the interns do. Um, are, they, are their technical skills good enough? So the, one of the things that we give them to do is uh, the Corbusier model as like a rite of passage in their first week. So rather than, um, because they come in all shapes and sizes and all, kind of, all kinds of skill sets, uh, we think that um, giving them a physical model to build from a 
well-known work from the Corbusier is the best way to go. Yeah, next. And oftentimes, um, we try as much as possible to advocate the use of uh, the orange volume of books you see at the top, right? Which is the Oof Complex. The Oof Complex is Le Corbusier's uh, personal portfolio, and it contains his original sketches and drawings. So in terms of sources, we think that uh, we try as much as possible to follow his original design intentions. Thanks. And oftentimes, um, the sources of the drawing from the Oof Complex is in itself insufficient to tell you, because like, um, most architects, sometimes we sketch on a project, but we abandon the idea. So some of the more obscure projects in the booklets of his portfolio are not so well conceived. So it requires a bit of imagination to kind of uh, do a bit of research. Sometimes even YouTube videos to kind of see what other people have uh, theorized about it. And in the case of this model, uh, a 3D model uh, animation of the pavilion was useful in helping us to shape the forms of the roof. Mix. And one, one story to tell was how this project all started was uh, in 2021, I was actually tasked to uh, go to the model graveyard in our attic to actually seek out the Le Corbusier model. So at a point of time, I was like a, a very new architect. So I was really unfamiliar with Le Corbusier work. So it was a huge challenge for me to kind of see out. And not all the models are in great condition. Some of them are badly damaged. So it requires a bit of work to touch up. And this was the first exhibition that we did for the Alliance Francais in Singapore in 2021 as part of the Singapore Architecture Fest. And um, to date, we are proud to say that the uh, University of Calgary is the 19th exhibition to host it. Uh, we have traveled the exhibition. Um, the exhibition has been to Indonesia, Malaysia, and most parts of Europe, including the World Architecture Festival in Lisbon. And, uh, this is the first stop in North America. And in terms of uh, traveling with the exhibition, uh, a few of my colleagues and I will take turns to travel along and also help with the setup. So it's, it is one way to also see the world and also experience the Corbusier for ourselves. And um, this slide is a tribute to the late John Louis Cohen. Uh, we had, some of our colleagues had the uh, opportunity to meet him just two months ago before he passed away. So we were working on a Shanghai exhibition together where they featured 12 of our models. So we would like to uh, tribute this slide to the late John Louis Cohen. Next. And in terms of uh, the idea for the exhibition really is to keep things simple in a do-it-yourself manner so that uh, different hosts can actually find easy to follow instructions to set up the pedestals. Next. And also, um, the concept for the pedestals was a modular one, which can adapt flexibly to any space. So we actually did like a double helix arrangement for the World Architecture Festival in Lisbon. And in KL, we did like a star-shaped layout. And the models come in five crates, so all the models and pedestals are packed into these easy-to-ship wooden boxes that will help with the transportation. And I guess the next step uh, is that we have, in terms of modeling out the models, we have built up an archive of digital models because before the interns actually build the physical ones, they, they take the opportunity to model in like either SketchUp or Rhino, some of you are familiar with. So I guess the next step is to help us uh, create a digital exhibition in addition to the physical one that you see here. Thanks. <coughs> And um, in terms of uh, documenting the exhibition, we have always kept uh, like a journal of our travels in the form of a small A6 booklet. And recently, the exhibition was also awarded the Singapore Institute of Architects Design Award for the year. Uh, and I think the next step is to convert these booklets into a full-scale full book on its own. Now I'll hand over the time back to Renee to wrap up the presentation. Thank you. Yes, hi, thanks, uh, Ian. I'll just close off this uh, talk uh, with the last five or six slides. And uh, people always ask us, so Renee, Ian, Artie, and Gil, what's next? I'll tell you what's happening. Because of numeral, numerous requests from Jean-Louis Cohen in Shanghai and then in Austria and a few other places, we have started a second uh, set of uh, models. 
And uh, we have about 50 models above the 150 that's actually there in uh, Calgary. So we have a second line that we can always uh, use. And uh, people always ask me too, so what have you, Renee, learned yourself from all this? Because we are always talking about interns and teaching. I think I've become a student of sorts and I've realized the relevance of uh, Le Corbusier, especially in the issues of design diversity. I, I've come to realize that Corp Corbusier is really beyond the, uh, the Villa Savoirs and the Barbara Churches and the Ronchon Chapels. And the value of this collection, and uh, I don't know how much of it is exposed to you all there, uh, I would always say uh, resides in the uh, three uh, years, the unbuilt, the unknown, and the unseen Le Corbusier. For instance, my favorite uh, model is uh, Row 3 Extreme Lab, the uh, Maison Murundan, uh, which was a series of uh, refugee housing that Corbusier did in anticipation of a refugee uh, crisis after the Second uh, World War. And in terms of unfinished projects, very little pe few people know about this uh, dam that Cobb had done when he was uh, in Chandigarh. The dam was already halfway in construction when he was asked to come and do a few things, but it was actually left uh, rather uh, unfinished. And uh, virtually unknown because it spent some time at the bottom of the River Seine in Paris is this uh, Salvation Army barge that Cobb had actually designed. So what is exciting for us at least is to know that Corp was actually designing for everyone on the street and not just the rich and famous uh, in, uh, in France. And it showed us a few unseen relationships uh, in La Tourette. Even if we were to build uh, models of familiar projects, we hope to do it in uh, section form so that we can see the untold, the unseen uh, relationships. For instance, even uh, the Villa Savoie, and I know the model is there in Calgary, uh, we always walk up and down the ramp, but we really don't see certain unforeseen relationships between elements and spaces. And then the unimaginable, this was a uh, funerary chapel he designed in Caracas uh, that was uh, never built. So this was an opportunity for us to, uh, to put it in tangible form and to share it with uh, the world. This is uh, the last slide. The next stop would be uh, Toronto, where it's headed for a couple of weeks. And before I uh, finish, I want to thank uh, Dean John Brown again, and the team, Anita, Tracy, and everyone at Calgary for giving these, uh, these uh, architectural refugees a, uh, a temporary home. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, Renee, and, uh, and John and Jason and everyone involved for, for bringing this incredible uh, set of models to Sapple and, and Calgary. And, and thanks, of course, again to Ian for helping to organize and set up the exhibition. Uh, good evening. My, my name is Rob Birch. I'm a sessional instructor at Sapple, as well as uh, an architecture practitioner here in Calgary. With Graham Libsey, I, I'm also the co-curator of, of Sapple's rendition of, of this exciting exhibition. Um, out of the 150 plus models that, that Renee and, and Ian have put together and, and coordinated and that are part of the exhibition, we've selected a series of 60 uh, to show here in Calgary, curated through this notion of, of an archival Um It's well known that Le Corbusier was enamored by the sea and, and ocean liners. Uh, seashells and beaches and, and the like. Enjoyed voyaging and looking at the world, closing these great distances and gaining new geographic perspectives uh, through this height and speed offered, especially through airplanes. He was, of course, a widely influential architect who remains very complex and controversial. Uh, I'll just go through this quote that I think you have on, on the, the handouts that come with the exhibition it's from 1954. Uh, where, where Le Corbusier uh, links his, this idea of geography and his own working environment and processes through the metaphor of, of the archipelago and the island. 
I live in my archipelago, my sea, it's 30 years of accumulations, diversely attached to intellectual and manual activities. Here and there on the ground, groups of objects, devices, books, texts, drawings, these are my islands. There are very clear islands of work. The island of the telephone, the workbooks, the intermittent and imperative daily work. There are volcanic islands which emerge and disappear at the chosen hour. A sheet of plywood on the arms of two chairs. Here I edit a book, prepare an article, dictate something. Last year there is the vertical island, the painting easel in front of the island of colors. The archipelago is tight. The passes are narrow. But I navigate within them with the security and precision of an old captain. This exhibition is understood as a collection of islands, an archipelago, implying some kind of distance, geographic, temporal, ideological, through which to travel. Islands occupy a space that, it, that is at once both isolated and connected. They're often sites where moder modernity's impact is mediated through isolation and the struggle for independence. Often sites of colonization, islands are, are frequently pregnant with conflict, politics, culture, and, and a struggle for identity. And it's through this lens that we, that Graham and I, have read this curated selection of models. And so in turn, we read these islands and these projects themselves, sitting sort of precariously within modernity's advance, embracing and, and challenging its influence. The closing of some kind of distance is required in order to access these islands. How this is achieved is left to the viewer. The islands can be visited at random, read as independent moments, or they can be understood as an archipelago, interconnected by some found narrative thread that moves between the projects and locales, chronologically, geographically, or otherwise. How these sort of intermittent fragments are assembled and visited amidst the surrounding sea is left to the viewer. And so our archipelago, our, our islands of the exhibition in the way we've structured it, uh, begins with early houses in Switzerland and follows through to his late work in India. The models in this particular iteration are displayed and organized geographically as a group of islands that establish this global archipelago allows the viewer to sort of understand the evolution of, of Luc, Le Corbusier's work, along with the geographical range of his designs and his ideas. So on behalf of John and Graham and Jason and everyone at, at, and myself and everyone else at South, we hope you enjoy traveling through this exciting exhibition uh, as much as we've enjoyed preparing it. And take this opportunity to revisit and rethink the work of Le Corbusier. I'll just take a few moments now to, to introduce our, our um, esteemed uh, guest lecturer. Uh, Miguel Adria is a, an architect, historian, and critic trained at the Higher Technical School of Architecture of Barcelona and holding a Doctor of Architecture from the European University of Madrid. The author of over 30 books on Latin American architecture and the director of Arch and Architect Architecture magazine reviews architecture in Mexico and Latin America. He's a jury member of multiple international awards, director of Mex Mexico Poly Architecture and City Festival, and director of architecture at Central University. Miguel is the author of the book La Sombra del Cuervo, a critical and historical review of the impact of Le Corbusier, Le Corbusier on modern Latin American architecture, specifically in Mexico. The book looks at, at at this work through the lenses of the work of Louis Barragan, Juan O'Gorman, Teodoro Gonzalez de Leon, among others. So please join me in welcoming our inspiring and esteemed guest for this evening, Miguel Adria. To be here with uh, you virtually, but uh, uh, talking about uh, Le Corbusier and uh, his heritage uh, worldwide. Uh, are you listening? Are you listening? Uh, okay. Yes. 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 So uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you, uh, uh, Francisco, Anita, and the Calgary University, and uh, the exhibition 
seems to be great and I wish that could come uh, uh, to Mexico as well of this all different places that have already been traveling around. <clears throat> Let me share the my uh, presentation. Okay, uh, let, let me talk about this idea that uh, how uh, uh, Le Corbusier uh, had uh, this big influence uh, worldwide. Uh, uh, and in the case that I, I, I would talk uh, about, it's, it's Mexico. Uh, Le Corbusier, uh, as you know, uh, who was a Swiss architect born in Cholefon in in 1887, uh, August 6, uh, he have never been in Mexico. This is important to start with this point. He have never been in Mexico. He have uh, traveled to, to America, uh, basically, uh, especially to Buenos Aires, uh, where he planned to, to design a house for a very wealthy a uh, woman, but he was not success uh, with this project. And uh, he uh, built a uh, uh, building in in US, as we will see, and uh, a house and a studio and office was built finally in in Argentina, but uh, he sent uh, the, the drawings to a local architect. Uh, so uh, he knew just a few, and he wrote uh, some uh, very strong statements related how was not impressed with uh, the skyline of uh, New York, uh, but he was very impressed with the idea of the horizontal, uh, the horizon in in uh, in Buenos Aires, uh, but uh, he uh, didn't know much about Mexico, and he have not been uh, uh, here. But his, uh, his works were very important, as they were very important all around the world. But uh, why this work of uh, this is such a uh, uh, important architect was uh, was so successful. It was because of his works, his buildings, uh, or he it was uh, he he was very successful because his ideas. I have to say that basically both, but uh, the the books that he published were a very strong weapons to communicate these ideas of the modernity. In Mexico, just to talk about a few of them. Uh, uh, he was uh, 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 very determining in the in the career of uh, a lot of architects, but I just will talk about these four: uh, Juan O'Gorman, uh, Luis Barragan, who got uh, the Pritzker Prize at the beginning of the eighties; uh, Mario Pani, who was the most successful architect in Mexico in the fifties. And Teodoro Gonzalez de Leon, who just died six years ago, but he was uh, one of those architects who traveled to Paris and finally worked uh, at the Le Corbusier Atelier. Uh, projects like this of uh, uh, Juan O'Gorman when he was just uh, 23 years old, 24 years old, uh, are strongly related to projects like this, the studio of Amedeo Zemfan uh, in Paris, the partner of, uh, of uh, the Purism uh, style uh, with uh, Le Corbusier, uh, or this very well-known stair, uh, interior stair uh, in the house, studio and house of uh, uh, Luis Barragan, and that 
became one of the, the most well-known stars uh, in, the, in, the, in the mid 20th century. It's also related to some of the stairs that previously uh, Le Corbusier designed, like here in this uh, roof garden in Paris. Or uh, the projects that uh, Mario Pani had the opportunity to build in the mid 20th century are closely related to these ideas that Le Corbusier designed 15 years before. Uh, or the, the project, one of the out of the projects that uh, uh, Teodoro González de León built uh, in Mexico uh, are also uh, strongly related to some of the projects that uh, Le Corbusier uh, built, in this case, uh, in, in Ahmedabad in, in India. Um, and uh, basically, I have to say that uh, Le Corbusier was not uh, really successful in America. Uh, he just built this extraordinary carpenter center in Massachusetts, uh, thanks to his his old friend and who worked at his office, uh, Joseph Lewis Sert, who became the dean of Harvard and who invited him to build uh, this uh, building, or the, this uh, small uh, house and and a studio for uh, the doctor, the doctor uh, Curuche in uh, La Plata, Argentina. But that was a project that he, I have to insist on that, he just sent uh, by mail and a local uh, architect, uh, Amancio Williams, uh, built in, in a much more Le Corbusier way than Le Corbusier uh, uh, himself. Uh, this is uh, just to have an idea of uh, the, the lifetime of these architects. Uh, the yellow uh, is uh, the life of uh, Le Corbusier from, from 1887 to 1965. And in this period, uh, just a few years later, some of these Mexican architects were born, like uh, Luis Barragan in, in 1902 or uh, Juan O'Gorman in 1905 later Mario Pani in 1911, and finally Teodoro González de León in 1926. The, 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 these spots of colors, this, uh, uh, are just uh, the moments where the career of these this, uh, Mexican architects were in some way much Corbusians. Some of them in a very intensive way, like Juan O'Gorman, uh, he was uh, absolutely Corbusian uh, just for a few years and some others like Teodoro González de León. It was an, an, uh, an intense but uh, experience all uh, long of uh, his life. Uh, Juan O'Gorman uh, belonged to a family uh, related uh, to the culture. Uh, his father, and also one of his brothers were very well-known uh, writers, and he was a very good good uh, uh, draftman, and also he became a very good architect. He worked uh, with uh, uh, some painters, uh, Mexican uh, well-known painters like uh, uh, Diego Rivera, but first of all, he built this house for his father. Uh, I have to say that his father never uh, lived in that house, but it was a way to let his 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 son uh, to promote himself with the new ideas of the modernity. What did he build in this house? He did just all the main concepts of Le Corbusier. The idea of uh, La Maison Domino. The idea of just have a uh, pilotis and these slabs, uh, the most simple way of building uh, the structure of uh, a building. And understanding that once uh, you have already built that, everything is done. So what he has to do is how to design uh, the, the most and um, extremely uh, essential uh, facade uh, 
and in some way much more radical than than Le, Cor Le Corbusier himself, uh, because uh, the, there are not handrails; it's uh, all open and trying to show the the main ideas of uh, of of the five points of uh, Le Corbusier: the floor plan uh, free and uh, the staircase uh, outside, the independence of the structure to the facade, uh, and so. And uh, one and a half year later, he bought uh, the piece of land of the same uh, area uh, to this uh, artist, Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo, and he made the studios for them, two separate pieces uh, that are very close related to uh, the Ozenfan studio in Paris designed by Le Corbusier. This idea of the shed on the roof, uh, the, the industrial way to, 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 to have uh, this natural light from the north, for example, uh, the perfect orientation to the north with all this big uh, uh, window, and uh, the independence of the structure itself are uh, the paradigms of, of, of the Le Corbusian uh, uh, purism uh, architecture. Uh, this is the Atelier Zenfant by Le Corbusier, and you could see the same shape of the roof and the great uh, window, the, the, the la fenêtre corridor, uh, the, the window, the horizontal window, and also the helicoidal stair outside. All those elements you could find here in the studios of Diego, Diego, Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. But I have to say that all the information that this young architect had was just few books, black and white. So he had no idea that Le Corbusier at the, in the, the end of the 20s was already painting some of his uh, uh, buildings, especially those in, in Bordeaux. Uh, and uh, uh, the young uh, Juan O'Gorman, the very young architect in that moment, decided to introduce this uh, new Mexican palette of colors to the modern buildings uh, in the most radical way of uh, Le Corbusier. At the same time, this uh, young architect in these years built some studios for uh, some other uh, clients. He is for his, his uh, brother Edmundo, who was a writer. Uh, and this is um, the minimum a cabinet uh, to build inside, uh, uh, or this one a uh, studio for another intellectual like uh, Julio Castellanos, that uh, there is a, a close uh, relationship uh, with uh, the cook house of uh, uh, Le Corbusier. You could see this one is uh, Le Corbusier, and uh, the same concavity and convexity of uh, one of the facades uh, becomes literally uh, from the drawings that he saw in the book of uh, Le Corbusier. We know that he had the best in architecture, uh, for example, but some other images from uh, different uh, books and publications of that time. Uh, here also we could find in this uh, La Roche uh, building in Paris, uh, where is the, the Le Corbusier Foundation now, uh, it's uh, also a way, uh, one of those ideas that that uh, Juan O'Gorman uh, kept and made uh, uh, his own way of doing architecture. Again, uh, that moment, uh, uh, Juan O'Gorman uh, did uh, this other uh, building, uh, in two apartments, uh, with uh, the three... Uh, ground floor, the, the, <clears throat> the roof garden, and the, the, the window, the horizontal window, and the independence of the structure uh, with all the main ideas of Le Corbusier. After that, uh, Juan O'Gorman uh, did several projects of bigger scale, basically for the schools. Uh, he did, I think, uh, 12, 13 uh, public schools in a uh, very interesting moment of uh, how culture uh, was something important in Mexico. 
uh, and uh, he built all those structures in concrete uh, and uh, in a very uh, uh, radical and simple way of building uh, all these pieces, the handrails uh, and all the elements, but uh, probably more related not only to, to Le Corbusier, but also some constructivist uh, buildings uh, with this reference of the power, the, the water on the roof, etc. And other schools, another schools, and also the building for the for the for the movie makers, uh, Sindicato de Cinematografía is something that like uh, the union of the movie makers. And again, we could find all those elements um, of more canonics of the of of, of the Le Corbusier. Uh, main ideas. So the roof garden on the top, uh, the open, uh, the, the open plan, the and this concavity and convexities on the facade again. After that, uh, he uh, in that moment, uh, Pano Gorman thought that uh, architecture could be something important to make a better world. Uh, modern architecture uh, could be the way to have uh, the opportunity to give a uh, good uh, housing for everybody. But uh, after a personal crisis, he discovered that that was just a, a better way to make richer the builders, but uh, that nothing changed, in, in meaning that architecture, he, he, he arrived to the conclusion that architecture was not the way to change the world. And nothing changed, just the rich people could be richer with modern architecture. So he, de he decided to left architecture. And he became a great painter and very obsessive. You could see in that drawing how he painted himself in several ways and how uh, there are a lot of elements, uh, symbolic elements, for example, the, the devil, uh, in one side, and the moon and the sun, or uh, Diego Rivera on the floor. Um, until 15, 18 years later, he came back to the architecture. But he came back to the architecture hating the modern architecture, hating all those white buildings of Le Corbusier and his own modern buildings. And he decided to become a very a pintoresque uh, architect uh, using all those elements of the pre-Hispanic, Mexican pre-Hispanic architecture, thinking that uh, modern architecture is not uh, useful for cultures like Mexican and the Mexico have to uh, look for its own roots uh, on, uh, on the pre-Hispanic uh, uh, culture. Uh, uh, Juan uh, O'Gorman uh, finally committed suicide and uh, it was the, his way of leaving the world but also leaving the architecture as he did uh, several years before when he decided not to do more modern architecture. Luis, Ogo, uh, Luis, Luis Barragan, uh, who I mentioned he he, he got the, the Pritzker Prize in 1982. And uh, he, uh, in some way, we can say that he bring to the architecture something that it was not before in the architecture. At the beginning, he was an architect from uh, uh, Guadalajara, Jalisco. I mean, it's not in the capital, it's in the province area, uh, doing a kind of eclectical a uh, half modern, high local architecture, high quality, but uh, he moved to Mexico City just to to put distance between his own place and uh, and Mexico City, where he decided that could really make a good and contemporary architecture in that time. And in the first projects, we can see his interest on the the physical ideas of the modernity, especially uh, this modernity related to Le Corbusier. 
uh, as we can see in that small apartment building. Or in that one, the, the white one on the left, on the right, sorry, uh, that he did this four studios for artists in also again, a Le Corbusian way with that kind of uh, window to the to the to the sky on the on, uh, showing the that there is a kind of a, a roof garden on the top and but uh, let's say in a very modern way to understand architecture as some other architects did in that time after that he moved to a, a more coloristic architecture more close clusters and patios and playing with the light, uh, with the interior light and the transparency of the colors in different uh, works, uh, painting the light of his spaces and also uh, uh, creating this kind of a very emotional experiences uh, in architecture, uh, with, uh, like in this, this small uh, chapel, uh, or uh, working in this idea of the roof garden uh, and the privacy uh, of the rooms without ceiling. But that uh, is something that arrived after uh, some a couple of uh, trips that he did to Europe and the north of Africa. And finally, in one of these trips, uh, well, this is a drawing of a uh, a Rufino, uh, not, uh, uh, Jose Clemente Orozco, a Mexican painter, where there is a confusion of where the light comes. And that's a way of he use the color in his places, in his uh, roof gardens, as, as this painter used to play with the shadow and the light over the walls. But I was telling that the change of his architecture came uh, after these trips to Europe, uh, where he met finally Le Corbusier. This was in his own house, everything related to the square, four squares that became a huge glass wall, a uh, square also, uh, the square table, the square uh, painting, uh, like uh, Joseph uh, Albers, in uh, everything is related uh, to the square and also the stair in his uh, studio area in, in his own house. It's also related to this idea of the lightness uh, of the of, of the stair itself. Um, even though he likes to use this kind of very thick uh, walls, uh, connecting more to the to 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 the colonial architecture uh, of a uh, of uh, of the countryside in Mexico than uh, the modernity of uh, Le Corbusier. But talking about the visit that he had in Paris and when he met uh, Le Corbusier and basically he uh, Le Corbusier himself drew uh, the instructions how to go how to reach to Vilsawa uh, and uh, where uh, Luis Barragan visited the house, visit some other house very close from there, Villastein, for example. And, uh, and, and um, when he came back to Paris, uh, you know, these houses are uh, one hour uh, from, from, from Paris, more or less, uh, he went to the to the to his bookseller there, and he asked for all the books that uh, Le Corbusier uh, have ever published, because he decided that Le Corbusier was the best architect that have ever existed in the world. And uh, with that books, he changed his mind. He visited also the studio of uh, and the house and the and the and the apartment and the roof garden of Charles Vestegui, that was a, a very curious, a very interesting uh, man who who, make, uh, who made uh, his own fortune in uh, in Mexico, uh, with um, the mine, the mines, uh, the, the mines of uh, silver, 
And uh, he asked uh, Le Corbusier to have this apartment very close to uh, to L'Etoile. And uh, when he visited this space, he had the most astonishing experience, uh, understanding that you could have a room without ceiling. You could have this experience in the middle of the city, but where you cannot see the city. Uh, you need to, 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 to take a, a stair or a chair or something just to see the, <clears throat> and the, 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 the monument at the end of the city and connect to, to Paris. But this, that is probably the most surrealistic uh, work of uh, Le Corbusier impressed a lot this young architect in that time. And when he came back to Mexico, uh, he decided to work with this idea of architecture without ceiling in the roof garden of uh, the, 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 yeah, the roof uh, garden uh, in his own house, but in some other projects. Connecting with this idea of the, the different levels with this kind of stairs that uh, Le Corbusier designed, this in Unité Habitation uh, and, this, and this other. And uh, Le Corbusier, uh, Le Corbusier uh, uh, Luis Barragan, when he came back to Mexico, he designed this house for, for the artist that we, that we have seen this drawing before, Jose Clemente Orozco, his house in Guadalajara. And that was a kind of proposal to connect different parts to, to inhabitate the, the roof garden. Roof garden is not just a roof where nobody goes there. It's a part of the house. So he activated these parts of the house with these stairs and uh, like uh, he mm, will would do later in uh, Mexico City and Casa Ortega with this uh, stair that uh, connects two different parts of uh, roofs. And basically he copied himself the same stair to make that in wood and he put it in inside uh, his own house. Also, he worked a lot in uh, landscape uh, projects, uh, but basically uh, connecting with this idea of the open space, the possibility, uh, and not, not uh, relating the open space to the urbanism or the planning urbanism, but connecting with the idea of having these rooms, uh, this private and this intimacy in, in the open space of uh, these private gardens like this. So in this case, more related to neoplasticism and Mondrian and some others, uh, with this flat black uh, mirror and the white vertical uh, plan with this blue light at the end. And also with this uh, monumental and very interesting pieces in, in outside of the city, just at the entrance, let's say the, the door of the city in a very inclined uh, plan using this uh, false effect, uh, very related also to the, to the Baroque and uh, to, to Bernini, Palazzo Spada and some others but using uh, uh, the essential ideas of the, the poor materials and the use of the coin. <clears throat> uh, he irritates some ideas uh, in just a few buildings and just in few uh, projects. And in some way, he introduced to the architecture some ideas that not that that were not in 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 the in in the main uh, ways of understanding architecture the idea of making these private spaces these private rooms uh without ceiling that in some way came a uh, explode uh, when he visited the work of uh, le Corbusier. Another architect, very different architect, was Mario Pani, the most successful architect in the mid-50s, uh, that probably now 
nobody remember, uh, but uh, who studied in Paris, but in that time, probably he never uh, listened about uh, Le Corbusier, even he studied there, uh, because he studied in a very academic school and he was very, very young. And he came back to Mexico when he was 23. And he built some uh, eclectical buildings that he had the opportunity to do very soon, uh, doing this kind of uh, small skyscrapers in a very flat city like Mexico, uh, introducing some typologies that he knew uh, and he uh, learned in uh, Europe, uh, and also uh, introducing some ideas, not only of the double uh, high in the apartments, but also the idea of a uh, uh, one a uh, high and a half, like uh, some ideas that came from from other architects, like this Wells and Coates in 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 London. But uh, he tried from the beginning to push uh, the idea of having a kind of a metropoly, a uh, not just a big village, uh, very flat, but trying to to propose high rises and to propose no new ideas for the city. And that was very related to some uh, ideas, urban ideas uh, of uh, uh, Le Corbusier. Uh, he did uh, some of uh, those uh, eclectic buildings, uh, introducing also collaboration with uh, uh, painters and muralists and some others. But basically, would be after doing all those buildings, very important projects, uh, uh, pushing up uh, the city, uh, changing the scale of the city. But that will be when he had the opportunity to do the new uh, uh, master plan for the university campus. Uh, we have to recognize uh, something that he never recognized in his life, that um, he have understood or had listened for his first time about Le Corbusier by some of the students that he had and the students that work at his office as well. And, and the, all the main plan of the university came not from the project that he did and won the competition, but the drawings that uh, some, a couple of uh, students that worked with him did uh, uh, without uh, letting uh, Mario Pani know about these ideas. And that was a uh, rescue for, from uh, some other uh, teachers, very good architects in that moment, and uh, decided to change the project and uh, doing the project in the most uh, Le Corbusian way. So changing, mm, having different levels for the circulation, the vehicles in one way, the pedestrians in the other, uh, different uh, buildings in this, uh, let's say, Bill Radies, Le Corbusian Bill Radies uh, idea of uh, the city. Here we have uh, all the all the project organized from north to south. And in the edge, uh, east, west, we have the, all the stadium and all the monumental uh, buildings uh, uh, through, through, that, uh, through that tax. That's a preliminary drawing that uh, these two students have done in his office in, in, during the night. And uh, in that project that uh, Mario Pani and his partner uh, decided to invite uh, several architects to build all the projects in a very short period of time. He invited, they invited basically around 70 different architects of different generations. They kept the, one of the most important buildings, the, 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 the government uh, building of the university. Uh, that was uh, this building again with the participation of another artist muralist that was uh, Siqueiros. And uh, with uh, 
introducing some ideas, not uh, in the eclectical style that he used before uh, anymore, but introducing these ideas of the language of the modern movement. But one of the most clear relation with the legacy of uh, Le Corbusier would be in that project. That was a housing project that at the beginning uh, the client asked for uh, 200 units, but Mario Pani, who was very talented, and uh, he suggests why just 200 units? We could have 1,000 units there and we could make that uh, work. And that in a very rural area, right, right now this is a, not downtown, but it's a very urban area. But in that moment was a, was a, a almost a rural area. And he built that huge complex, uh, just, uh, just understanding the projects of Le Corbusier. Again, thanks to one of uh, his uh, students that work with him, uh, who invite him to know and to see the different uh, books that uh, those students already had. So the main ideas of Le Corbusier uh, were in those books. Uh, Le Corbusier have not ever uh, built a uh, Unité d'Habitation in that time. And uh, that was the project that uh, finally Mario Pani did. And during the construction, he traveled to Marseille. He wanted to, to meet uh, Le Corbusier. Uh, Le Corbusier never received uh, him, so they never met. But when he came back to Mexico, uh, not only had the impression that it was a cleaner country because Marseille for him seemed uh, a very dirty uh, city everywhere. But also he said, well, uh, my unit of habitation will be much more bigger, what was true, uh, much, much more uh, efficient because the kitchens uh, will have a natural ventilation looking outside. That was also true, and uh, and I will finish that before Le Corbusier, and that was also true. So that uh, complex uh, housing building was uh, finished one year before than uh, Le Corbusier uh, finished his uh, first uh, unité d'habitation in Marseille. Uh, that was uh, the, the, the aspect. Again, the section is a very Le Corbusier section with a uh, this promenade uh, every three floors, uh, having the elevators that stops just uh, every three floors. So that made uh, also the elevator cheaper. That was a way to convince the client that could be built a building like this and that would not mean that will be much more expensive. Uh, with a very poor, uh, very cheap materials, concrete uh, structure and and, uh, and all those uh, elements uh, with all the, the, the social areas like the swimming pool, the kindergarten, and, and so on. But basically, this main idea came from uh, the ideas, the project of uh, Unité Habitation that Le Corbusier had already uh, published in, in, in his in his books. Uh, like this, another project of uh, Mario Pani, one year later, uh, was this uh, this uh, high uh, flat um, buildings, uh, again, uh, related to these uh, main ideas uh, of Le Corbusier. And in, in that way, uh, in this uh, huge, uh, neighborhood, uh, again, he proposed these parallel uh, buildings, like uh, like the, the, the main urban ideas of uh, Le Corbusier, but also not only uh, the, the common areas for all the community, 
but also introducing the idea of a, a street that goes down just to, to separate the circulation of the cars and the pedestrians. So he invented, he invented in some way something that it was forbidden in Mexico. Once, because Mexico City basically is on a lake, a, a dry lake, but basically is a lake, and it's not allowed to build uh, useful areas uh, uh, under the, the, the line of, of the natural floor. But also it was also forbidden because it was not allowed to have a property over a street in that moment. But he introduced that because he wanted to be very Corbusian, very uh, to do the, the, the things the new town, the new city, the new ideas should be done and should be done in that moment and should be done in that Mexico because Mexico, that was a very wealthy, high-growing economy after the Second World War, uh, wanted to, to be on the, on the top of the main ideas of the modernity. After that, he built several projects uh, like this airport in Acapulco that was basically a new a, a fisher, it was a small fisher uh, village that became a, a, an extraordinary point of uh, tourism that was something new uh, in the world and he had to build everything, the airport and uh, a lot of uh, social uh, buildings in that area introducing some ideas of the modernity but more related to the architecture that uh, some organic uh, architects like uh, Oscar Niemeyer were doing in that time in Rio de Janeiro. But another important project that was built by uh, uh, Mario Pani was this uh, extraordinary huge neighborhood in the 60s. Uh, and I have to say that when he finished the book, I when he finished the the, the 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 neighborhood, the buildings, he sent uh, some of these images to to the the architecture magazine in Paris, Architecture du Jour, and these guys in Paris sent him back a letter saying, uh, "We are sorry, we do not publish uh, unbuilt projects or models uh, because they really in, do not believe that what that." this huge project was was built. But basically, the main ideas came not only from Ludwig Hilversheimer, like these drawings, uh, but also to this idea of the modern city, uh, the new cities, the Ville Radius uh, of uh, uh, Le Corbusier. This is the floor plan of this huge neighborhood of uh, two kilometers by 500 meters and all the buildings align, and in the most canonic way to understand the modern urbanism. And also, also this radical use of colors, black and white, and, and so on. <clears throat> and here with the relation with the, the pre-existing uh, ruins, uh, pre-Hispanic ruins, in that in that area. That's uh, contemporary to those projects that some architects in Europe were doing, just following some ideas of Le Corbusier. Let's uh, think of uh, Georges Candelis in France, but also in some uh, countries in North Africa, or the um, uh, Alison and and Peter Smithson in, in, in England, this idea of having uh, a pedestrian street in different levels that came basically uh, from the sections of the, of the Unité d'Habitation of Le Corbusier. Uh, again, he kept, this, he kept these ideas of uh, having uh, these uh, pedestrian uh, promenades uh, in different levels just to to arrive to different apartments and in different contexts as well. 
Also, as a urbanist, uh, he designed new towns in different areas of uh, of the city. This case was in the north area. It was a satellite uh, city in the north of Mexico City. And here you could see the towers that I shown before of uh, Luis Barragan. He also was uh, the editor of the best magazine of the in Mexico in the 20th century, and uh, where he tried to push the modern architecture, he import uh, to Mexico all those uh, relevant uh, projects uh, built everywhere, especially all the main ideas of Le Corbusier. Uh, and he used also the magazine to publish uh, some projects uh, himself. And after being the most important architect in the mid uh, in the mid 20th century, uh, at the end uh, he became almost an uh, unknown uh, architect. Uh, some of the buildings were uh, were broken, were being uh, damaged in uh, several. Uh, uh, earthquakes and uh, but in some way he has he had also this heritage strong heritage from uh, uh, from uh, Le Corbusier. The last is uh, Teodoro Gonzalez de Leon, uh, this uh, very talented uh, architect who worked at the office of Mario Pani, who had the books of Le Corbusier, who informed Mario Pani about the Corbusier, and that's how Mario Pani introduced some ideas of uh, Corbu uh, in, uh, in the university campus or in this um, a great uh, a housing units that I have, that I have shown uh, now. Uh, this uh, young architect, he decided to, to leave Mexico and he went to Paris. And he worked, uh, you could see him at the end of the studio on the left. Uh, we do not have any image uh, with Le Corbusier, uh, they two together, uh, but at least we have this information where we can see both in the same place. And he was very uh, uh, influenced, very affected, very uh, uh, in, in a very deep way. I mean, not in the literary way of taking some images or taking some ideas from the, the books or event, eventually from uh, some uh, building, but in a very deep way, he has understood the, the way of thinking of Le Corbusier. When he came back to Mexico, he worked uh, for uh, some... Uh, public uh, um, organizations to make uh, different projects, housing projects. Uh, but uh, as soon as he could make some uh, public buildings, this is a, a university school, uh, he introduced this idea of the monumentality that had uh, Le Corbusier. But we are not talking anymore about the, the purism a style of Le Corbusier of the of the twenties of the thirties. We are talking about the Le Corbusier that he met, the Le Corbusier of the post Second World War, uh, the Le Corbusier who built uh, l'unité d'habitation, who did, who built uh, La Chapelle de la Tourette, and who were beginning to travel to India to design uh, Chandigarh, uh, and from this. The ideas and those projects became some of this new architecture uh, in a very abstract, very monumental uh, way to understand architecture. So chronologically, and this much later than the others, uh, could be related to some other architects of his own generation, like uh, uh, Batistana Doshi, uh, who was very, uh, who, who took from Le Corbusier uh, some of those ideas of the monumentality, the idea to bring to the city uh, some spaces, uh, every opportunity that he had to build a building, he tried to give to the city something else. 
uh, and to introduce this confusing and very exciting idea to have uh, spaces that you never know if you are inside or you are outside, if it rains or it not rains, uh, like uh, this uh, beautiful uh, courtyard also in a university uh, project. Uh, working uh, just with one material, the, the concrete, uh, the natural concrete, uh, that what in French, uh, uh, Le Corbusier named it beton brou. Uh, the idea of it's a kind, in a very free way to translate that, could be a dirty concrete. Uh, it's not exactly, but uh, could could be understood also like this. And this idea of leaving the concrete as it comes. And uh, like this, he did also this beautiful museum and some others where the the all the Le Corbusian modern heritage uh, find uh, a certain relationship with some uh, pre-Hispanic, let's say Aztecs and Mayan architectures, local architectures, and that he in some way uh, put uh, together. This is exactly a full uh, Mayan arch that he introduced in this symbolic way in this huge uh, new new building. And well, again, introducing these ideas that uh, are uh, also in the Baroque, but never in the Mexican Baroque that was always flat, but that comes from these ideas of concavity and convexity on the work of uh, Le Corbusier as well. And uh, well, some other uh, buildings where he introduced, again, these ideas of the open uh, city, the, the idea of the monumentality with poor uh, elements, like uh, Le Corbusier was doing was doing is in in, in a, basically in Chandigar. <laughs> and uh, again, some uh, more recent projects uh, already in the 90s, where the concrete uh, was the only material and the idea of uh, the, the building as a piece of the city, as it happens with uh, Le Corbusier, the last expressionist and uh, uh, let's say a brutalism of uh, Le Corbusier, uh, the building relates much more to the city than the expression of the function of the building itself. And some other projects always with this kind of abstraction and always uh, with just one material. And like a kind of a a testimony or heritage of his own work was his own house at the beginning of the 21st century. That is a kind of a, a compendium, a accumulation of a, all those ideas that he brought from Le Corbusier, the idea of the brisole, uh, the idea of the bowl, the idea of the use of the three uh, colors, and uh, like a recognizing the origin of all those ideas uh, of Le Corbusier. And also with his paintings. And the left is a Le Corbusier a, a collage and drawing. And a right hand is a kind of a flat sculpture of uh, Teodoro González de León. So also in the way of how to express uh, not only the architecture, but also all those arts, applicate arts that could be used with the architecture, keep being uh, very close uh, to the work uh, of Le Corbusier as well. His last uh, projects, uh, uh, looking for the abstraction, and that was at the end, few months before he died, we traveled together to Marseille, uh, well, also to France to visit some buildings of Le Corbusier and uh, also in Marseille uh, 
uh, we visit uh, La Unité d'Habitation where he remind he remember he, he remind me that he were there when he was just 20 few years and uh, with a uh, um, with uh, some other architects of uh, the atelier of Le, Le Corbusier, like uh, uh, Georges Candelis, who was uh, 10 years older. And they were very afraid because uh, when when the first column, the first huge pilotis of the Unité Vitation was uh, discovered, uh, uh, they thought that that was very tusk, very bad build. And finally, when Le Corbusier arrived uh, uh, to the place, he was very excited because he found that that was the best way to let the concrete express itself. So that was a very uh, strange reaction for uh, uh, Teodoro González de León. And uh, he was very impressed on that. And after that, uh, when uh, he, he, he did his own work in Mexico, he always kept this idea of the only one material that express itself, like uh, Le Corbusier. Uh, this uh, Le Corbusier that uh, just have visited shortly America in Buenos Aires, uh, that's very far from Mexico, and uh, uh, to the US in a very short visit. Uh, uh, and uh, this architect that I've never been in Mexico, he was very important for the Mexican architecture, as it was very important for the architecture everywhere. Uh, and uh, this architect that, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, one one day of August, when he went to see to swim and he had uh, a heart attack, uh, without knowing. But thanks the strong uh, importance of his uh, his books, his ideas through the books more than his uh, buildings, uh, he helped to change the architecture in Mexico. to say that it's such a fabulous occasion there with 300 people attending this uh, occasion. And I can tell you, it's uh, the largest uh, reception that I have seen. In Greece and uh, in Turkey, it was also very exciting because although a pope never built there, I think the Greeks and the uh, Turkish, they, are very, they have a close affinity uh, because of the travels that Corbusier did. But I'm very glad it's now in the, the uh, North America in a totally different uh, continent, and it's going to continue to make its way for the next uh, two years or so. Quite a long time, in fact. Thank you again, uh, the University of Calgary. But through images and all that, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, I can feel the excitement. Thank you again.